1911, Madame Curie won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. It was her second Nobel Prize. She won her first one in 1903 for physics with her husband Pierre Curie and the physicist Henri Becquerel. And if Madame Curie was alive today, and she could pick all the TEDx talks in the world to be at, she would choose this one. Because under the theme of fearless pursuits, Madame Curie has one of the most famous quotes about fear. And some of you may know it. Nothing in life is to be feared, it is only to be understood. And even though she was probably talking in the realm of science and discovery, I would argue that you could use that quote anywhere in life. Even a simple thing, if I were to ask you, how are you today? How would you answer that? Because I'm trying to understand how you are feeling. Are you going to be fearless and tell me exactly how you're feeling? Or are you going to finish the sentence behind me and say things like, I am fine, I'm good, I'm okay, and I'm not bad. These may be true, and especially on a day like this, I'm hoping you're feeling exhilaration, jubilation, and joy. But since you are students, I'm pretty sure you're feeling these as well. But I'm not here to ask you how you're doing today, because only you know the answer to that. I'm going to ask you a much tougher question that I definitely don't know the answer to, and I'm guessing some of you don't. It's not how are you today, it's who are you today. And where would we start? Well, of course, who were you yesterday? And more importantly, who will you be tomorrow? I'm asking for your identity. And we normally start with a name. I'm going to start with Paul. Paul Hudson. He was born in 1956, Liverpool, UK. And early on in his life, he changed his name to HR. But that is not the only thing he changed. Hands up if you recognize Paul. That's what I thought. You see, Paul changed the world in a space that a lot of people fear and don't understand very well. Forty years ago, Paul, who changed his name to HR, which stands for Human Rights, and his band, Bad Brains, took over Washington, D.C., and revolutionized the genre of punk and hardcore music. So amazing was their influence that people that saw HR Live said he was the greatest front person of a musical band ever. And if you were a follower of this band in the 80s, they became known with three letters. Three letters defined HR and bad brains. You see, what made them different is that they took the youthful and feral energy and turned it into something positive. But HR changed his name again. And by this time, the whole world is looking for him. Not so much where he lived, but where his heart, mind, and soul did. He was an enigma. But I think today we can find out a little bit about him. You see, 
he had an intense obligation to this. It's what made him unique. And you might think, well, I bet you I don't have that same intense obligation. Actually, you do. It might be dormant, but we all have it. He had intense obligation to the truth of his innermost feelings. His identity was his heart. And Glenn Friedman, who is pictured here, he is the person who came up with that quote in his response when someone asked him, what is the definition of punk music? He is one of my generation's greatest photographers. And some of you might have seen some of his photos. But before we get to that, having intense obligation to yourself is only half the battle. Because now you want to share your heart. Not parts of it, all of it, with hopefully as many people as possible. This is Peggy Oki. I do want to talk about Peggy Oki because she was the only female skateboarder of the Z-Boys. Thank you. Um, and this is where Glenn Friedman took the picture. If you can imagine him, he's pressed up against the fence right now, waiting for Peggy Oki to come up the incline. That schoolyard is abandoned. And then he's going to take his camera with a shutter speed of 1 125th of a second and capture that moment. Every being cries out differently to be heard. So he wanted to make sure that these moments the whole world would know about not just Peggy Oki, but him, Glenn Friedman, the photographer. This is Jay Adams. He is referred to by Tony Hawk, who's one of the great skateboarders of the 80s and 90s, as patient zero. Meaning he is the beginning of the aesthetic and the attitude of skateboarding. Look at his eyes. That is someone who knows exactly what they are doing as he's carving up that pool. Jay Adams also had a very hard life. He had a tough childhood. He had a tough adulthood. He spent some time in prison towards his later years, and just a few years ago, he passed away at the age of 53. Jay Adams and I have very little in common. I'm a math teacher. He was a skateboarder. But we are bound by that intense obligation to your innermost feelings. So that's why Jay Adams is one of my biggest influencers as a math educator. Go for it. Be true to your heart. But if you're going to be hard, you've also got to be soft. This is Glenn Friedman capturing a simple picture of a woman with two geese. Show your whole heart as often as you can. And this is where we kind of come somewhat full circle. Because this past March, I went to South by Southwest Edu Conference in Austin, Texas, and my three passions met head on. Mathematics, teaching, and the punk philosophy. But how I got to Austin and how I'm standing on stage here today, that's the story I want to share. Because I have to share my whole heart. So we'll start with me. I am Sunil. And like Paul, how much could you know just by my name and the way I look? In 2013, I quit teaching. It was one of the hardest things I had to do. There's no way in the world when I started teaching in 1994 that I thought I would plan a day to quit in 2013. And the Globe and Mail, Canada's largest newspaper, ran an opinion piece about me quitting teaching several years later. And if I'm going to be truthful to my innermost feelings, I have to tell you why I quit. I quit because I found the math that I had to teach 
excruciatingly boring. And it was not singing to my heart. And I quit. What kind of math did I want to do then? This is a crazy picture. This is a tower of threes, exponents, going all the way from the earth to the sun, 93 million miles. This is an actual number. Let's start to calculate it, starting from the sun coming down. Three, the exponent three, is three times three times three. That's 27. And now you're going to take that 27, and that becomes the new exponent. Three, the exponent 27. You know what that is? I'll tell you what that is. That's 7 trillion 625 billion 597 million 984,987. And we're only this little much down from the sun. We still got to go 93 million miles of doing this exponent stuff to even talk about something called Graham's number. Graham's number is asking a question about how to color lines with two different colors and it ends up in the 13th dimension. Emily Dickinson, the 19th century American poet, said, our imaginations are wider than the sky. Well, she never encountered Graham's number because mathematics is wider than our imaginations. We actually physically cannot comprehend the size of this number. Our minds cannot hold it. This is the kind of stuff I wanted to happen in my classrooms, and I could not. So, after I left teaching, I created the right angle, not far from here, in Markham, Ontario. This is going to be Canada's first math store school. We had a storefront that sold math, games, puzzles, shirts, mugs, and there was going to be a lounge area where parents could meet and play games, and there was classrooms in the back where people would do fun math and talk about stuff like Graham's number and build puzzles. Why am I talking in the past sense? Two weeks before the grand opening, there was a fire. And I lost everything. And I am probably the only person in this room who has literally seen their dreams go up in smoke. But by this time, I had accrued some scars, quitting failing, but you see, these scars are something we should not be shameful of. There's something which actually makes us human and beautiful and invokes empathy. And this Japanese art of precious scars, kintsugi, broken pieces of ceramic are put back together with gold symbolizing these are the most important elements of our life and that we should share these with as many people as possible. And when you have seen life through an impoverished lens at the age of 50 with a family to support, you're actually given a gift because you think you've lost everything? No you actually realize you have everything. This kind of gratitude you cannot read in a book. You can't go to a Saturday morning workshop over coffee and donuts. I have been so blessed that this gift of gratitude was given to me that even the smallest things in life from that moment on bring a huge smile to my face. And I'd like to share with you my most grateful idea about mathematics.
There's nothing wrong with the PowerPoint. That screen is supposed to be blank. That silence, that nothingness behind me, that is something in which all of you experience doing math. You know when you do a problem and you're running out of strategies and you're tired of thinking, you're tired of pondering, you know that this problem is going to get the best of you and you will not be able to solve it. That is one of the best moments in math because we're all asked to slow down in life. Well, mathematics is asking us to just stop. And you stare at the problem with this mild fatigue and maybe a smirk on your face. That is one of the greatest and most unheralded gifts of mathematics. It's causing you to be still. And if you're still long enough, often enough, you're going to get a glimpse at the highest aspirations of mathematics. There's that word, understand. Why is it there's so few people who understand the spirituality of mathematics. Why do so few people understand that? Because most of us fear something else. There's a lot of fear about mathematics. It's quite the opposite. There's a spirituality to it. I wrote a book, a math book, this is the last chapter. Strange chapter title, especially last chapter for a math book. See, this is the purpose for me for learning mathematics. If mathematics has this spirituality, isn't spirituality about connection with each other? So shouldn't mathematics be about connection and the best connections are friendships in places where you can safely share your whole heart. So if you get to know your heart really well, you listen to it, it will sing to you, it not only will be this guide, your identity, your heart, but it will help us answer that first question that I asked you at the beginning. Who will you be tomorrow if you listen to your heart? It will become your destiny. Thank you so much.